See, and the spikes were put on uh, through his feet. But now, see, the Lord in the book of the Revelation, see, what do you learn here? See, his feet were as brass. See, uh, that's um, the vision of the Lord uh, here. And then uh, um, his voice. Now, um, again, when we read the gospel records, it's, uh, it's very striking to realize that the world put the voice of Jesus Christ to death. In other words, they stopped his voice. They hated him so much that they crucified the Son of God and they stopped his voice. He, uh, he died he, in his body. He uh, could not uh, speak. But now, you see, and that's what the world did to the Lord Jesus Christ. See, they put out his eyes. They put out his voice. They didn't want to hear any more anything that Jesus Christ said, uh, anything that um, to do uh, with him. And then, uh, um, so uh, his voice, we read here in verse 15 of Revelation chapter 1. And the Bible says, And his feet like unto fine brass, and they burned in the furnace. I believe that refers to the judgment of God. But then, see, his voice, the Bible uh, says here, was as the sound of many waters. Now, what you have here, see, now, the world put out the voice of Jesus Christ. See, uh, the world stopped the voice of Christ. See, uh, they murdered him. They didn't want to hear anything that he would say. They didn't want to have anything to do with him. So they um, literally... Uh, murdered him, put out his voice. But now in verse 15, the Bible says, and his voice was as a sound of many waters. See, now what you have here is the glorified Lord Jesus Christ. So you have uh, Jesus in power. We've all been down uh, the shore and seen the, the waves breaking in and there's great uh, noise and power uh, there. And so that speaks of his power and his uh, authority. Now, another interesting thing, when we think of the earthly picture of Jesus Christ as contrasted with the heavenly picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, uh, the Bible teaches that his face was marred. Turn in your Bible to the book of Isaiah, and in Isaiah uh, chapter uh, 50. Now, uh, and we read over here an interesting thing in the Word of God. Isaiah chapter 50, and uh, we read here in verse 6. And the Bible says, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off uh, the hair. And I hid not my face uh, from shame and spitting. So what did they do, the face of the Lord Jesus Christ? They plucked out the hair on his face and they spit uh, in his face. And then as you turn over to Isaiah chapter 52, and we read here in um, Isaiah 52 and verse 14, and uh, as many were astonished uh, at thee, and his visage, or his appearance, his face, and so forth, uh, was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of man. Now, uh, so what we learn here in the Word of God is that during his earthly ministry, um, you see, his, uh, Jesus Christ was abu uh, uh, certainly abused as we study the Word of God. They slapped him, they hit him, they pulled out uh, the hair on his, uh, uh, on his face. So Jesus Christ was uh, abused. Now, if anybody saw Jesus Christ dying on the cross of Calvary, their thought uh, would have been of shock. See, uh, when you see somebody whose face was slapped and punched and, and then uh, the hair on his uh, face was pulled out, and somebody saw somebody like that, just like if you saw somebody like that uh, in the mall or in the store, you, you would be shocked. You'd be taken back. 
uh, that would be a shocking thing just to see somebody's face like that. But that's what the world did to the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, uh, no question about that as we read, especially uh, Isaiah. And so um, when you look at the body of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, see, it was a disfigured body, completely disfigured. Um, that's why uh, very seldom do you see uh, ever any picture of uh, the cross that would be true to the Bible. See, um, his, his face is disfigured. He's abused. And uh, as we think of the Word of God, see, it would be shocking uh, just to look at the Lord Jesus Christ. But now, see, the thing we need to keep in mind that's what the world did to Jesus Christ. See, they spit in his face. They pulled out uh, the hair on his uh, face. And, but now when you turn to Revelation chapter 1, see, now this is the glorified Lord in Revelation chapter 1. A very um, powerful passage in the Word of God. Now, in Revelation chapter 1 and, um, and verse 16, we see here the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he had in his right hand uh, seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun that shineth in its strength. Imagine that, you uh, bright sunny day, you cannot look up into the uh, sun. You need some good sunglasses on a bright sunny day. Now here, See, the Bible says his countenance or his face was as a sh uh, sun that uh, shineth uh, in strength. Now, see, that's a contrast to, uh, now, of course, uh, the one that Jesus is talking to here is John, the Apostle John. And he was an exile uh, on the isle. Uh, uh, he was a prisoner uh, exiled on the island of Patmos uh, when he got this uh, book and recorded it as God gave him uh, the Word of God. Now, um, you see, I think this is very helpful for us as Christians to put the Bible together. Now, who is John writing to? He's writing to someone who is faithful to the Lord. He's very, very old at this particular uh, time. And John remembers the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? See, he was there at that crucifixion. Now he's in exile because of his faithfulness to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is faithful to the Lord. And so he's on this island of Patmos as a prisoner. And he was banished there, the Bible says in chapter 1, for the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you see here the beauty of the Word of God. Now, uh, do you think when John got this, uh, can you think of how encouraged he would be? Now, here is the Son of God. Here is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, uh, he was beaten. He was abu abused. He was actually uh, disfigured uh, there on the cross of Calvary. Now, John is uh, a prisoner at this time because of his testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. But now he gets a vision of the glorified Lord Jesus Christ. See, uh, not the one who was crucified even when he rose again from the dead and uh, told Thomas, look at my hands and uh, sighed, and not the one that had the wounds in his body, but you see, somebody now that uh, he has a glorified vision of the Lord Jesus Christ. A great truth in the Word of God. Today, people mock Jesus Christ. The world doesn't want to have anything uh, to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. But we need to realize who he is. Now, uh, today, he's at the right hand of the Father in heaven, and he's the glorified Son of God. But the thing we want to point out, see, that's an interesting contrast here. And right at the beginning of the book, see, John is encouraged. See, uh, the Lord is telling him, get your eyes on the glorified Lord. See, uh, it's not always going to be a time of rejection. 
You see, but uh, uh, think of the Lord in glory. Get your eyes on uh, the glorified Lord Jesus Christ that we read about in chapter 1. Now, um, when you study the book of the Revelation, it's very, very interesting as you want to look at Christ in the book of the Revelation. Now, many times when we study the book of the Revelation, the first thing that comes to our mind is prophecy. And we have all the books and people that have made millions of dollars and uh, people that are making all kinds of money every six months when they uh, produce another Bible prophecy uh, book. Now, but you see, most everybody misses the boat of the book of the Revelation. Now, and the reason why I say that, see, this was written to John. This was to encourage John. Now, most Bible teachers would tell you today, uh, all of this thing has to do with prophecy today. And as a result of that, see, the New Testament Christians would not understand the book of the Revelation. They, and so it'd be a book that was uh, uh, unknown to them, a book they could not interpret, a book that they could not understand. But now, when you study the book of the Revelation what you really learn here is the glorified Lord Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of Bible teachers, they get in a lot of prophetic passages in the book of uh, the Revelation. But the thing is, many times they put that above Jesus Christ. See, and Christ is not glorified. He's not magnified in a lot of the teaching of the book of the Revelation and in a lot of uh, prophetic uh, teaching. Now, for instance, see, in the book of the Revelation, Jesus Christ is referred to as the Lamb of God 28 times. See, the most common way that Jesus Christ is referred to in the book of the Revelation is the Lamb of God. See, we're studying about the tabernacle. See, the shedding of His blood, the Lamb whose uh, blood was shed uh, for uh, the sins of the world. Now, see, so that's the main title and the way Jesus Christ is depicted in the book of the Revelation. Now, this very interesting thing. See, that's the way he is presented in the book of uh, the Revelation. Now, uh, for instance, um, a lot of times people uh, talk about the book of the Revelation and they uh, they may talk about the, the lion of the tribe of Judah, how the lion of the tribe of Judah is going to come back in power and so forth. And, uh, but uh, can somebody tell me how many times is, the, uh, is Jesus referred to in the book of the Revelation as the lion of the tribe of Judah? See, just one time in the entire book. Just one time. Now, He's referred to as the Lamb of God 28 times. He's referred to as the um, Lion of the tribe of Judah just one time. So that tells us something that, see, uh, the Lord in the book of the Revelation wants to get our eyes on Jesus Christ, see, and uh, as the Lamb of uh, God. Now, for instance, uh, how many times do you think uh, Jesus is referred to in the book of the Revelation as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. See, anybody have a thought there? How many times? You'd think that that would be repeated several times in the book of the Revelation. However, he's only referred to as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords two times in the entire book of the Revelation. This is very, very instructive. See, just two times the King of Kings and uh, Lord of uh, Lords. For instance, turn to Revelation chapter 17. Now, in Revelation chapter uh, 17 and in verse 14, Revelation 17 and uh, verse 14, and we read here in the Word of God, and it's talking here about how he in the future will put down all of the rebellion in the world. Now, in Revelation 17, verse 14, the Bible says, These shall make war with the Lamb. Now, see, that's a tremendous statement in the Word of God. The world today 
is at war with Jesus Christ. See, uh, now, of course, this is talking in the uh, latter end of the tribulation period. But, see, always remember that. See, the world is not at war with religion. See, but it is at war with Jesus Christ. Now, but you see what it says in verse 14 of Revelation 17. And these shall make war with the Lamb. But there you have the word lamb. You see, that's the way he's referred to in the mo uh, most commonly in the book of the Revelation. And it says, and the lamb shall overcome them. See, it's the lamb, see, that overcomes them. But look there in Revelation 17, verse 14. For he is, see, the lamb is the Lord of lords and king of King. So, but first of all, you have the title of Lamb of God, and the Bible says because he's the Lamb of God, he's the King of Kings and Lord of uh, Lords. So, um, that's very interesting as we study the book of the Revelation. In other words, nobody will rightly teach nor understand the book of the Revelation unless you realize that the most common way Jesus Christ is referred to in the book of the Revelation is the Lamb of God. Now, this is, again, something very interesting as we uh, uh, study uh, the Word of God. Do you realize even in the New Testament now, there are only three other references to the Lamb of God? Now, it's referred to 28 times in the book of the Revelation as the Lamb of God, but only three other verses in the New Testament, outside the book of the Revelation, refer to the uh, Lamb of God. And that's uh, John chapter 1. Remember when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming down the road, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, See, which taketh away the sin of the world. But then the, uh, the next reference in the New Testament, the second reference, is in Isaiah chapter 8. And there we read about the Ethiopian. He's uh, going from Jerusalem back home. And the Bible says that he has a Bible and he's reading the book of Isaiah about the lamb led to the slaughter. That's the second reference you have in uh, the Bible outside the book of the Revelation to uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, of course, Peter mentions the lamb in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19. Now, what's he talking about there? See, as uh, a lamb without blemish that was uh, uh, offered up uh, and shed his blood, his precious blood, so that we might be redeemed. Now, they are the only three references in the New Testament outside the book of the Revelation to the Lamb of God. John chapter 1, uh, Acts chapter 8, and uh, 1 Peter chapter uh, 1. Outside of that, there are no other references to uh, the Lamb of uh, God. Now, as we look in the Bible to uh, the references in the New Testament, or in the, especially the book of Revelation, you see, to the Lamb of God. See, that's the book of the Revelation. See, it's a revelation of Jesus Christ, and it reveals how um, he will come, he will conquer, but it's the Lamb of God that we want to look at uh, this evening. Now, for instance, in Revelation chapter 5 and in verse 9, we have those familiar words there in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9, and we find that they sing about the blood of the Lamb in Revelation chapter 5. So here you have the blood of the Lamb, uh, and they're singing about the blood of the Lamb in heaven. So you see, uh, it's very interesting as we study about the Lamb of God in the book of the Revelation. Now, Revelation chapter 1, and we read here in uh, verse 9. It says, and they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain. So now this is a book of the judgment of God upon the earth, 
And the reason why Jesus Christ has the authority to do that is because he was slain and he defeated Satan on the cross of Calvary. But as you read on here, see, he was slain. And the, uh, the word there for slain means he was violently slain. And as we saw that in uh, uh, our, our earlier thoughts. Now, and it, he says here, and that, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God. Say, thou hast set us free from our sin. We've been liberated from our sin. So, uh, and the Bible says here, by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Now, say, and so they are rejoicing in heaven in relation and singing about the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, appropriately so. Why? See, nobody ever gets to heaven apart from the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of people have a lot of good things to say about Christ. Uh, they have a good word to say about Jesus. But you see, nobody gets to heaven unless they have applied the blood of Jesus Christ and appropriated his blood in their life and are forgiven of their sins on the basis of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, again, sometimes there's a controversy about the blood, and, um, but uh, those that uh, do have a controversy about it say they're singing about the blood of uh, the Lamb in heaven. You see, why? Because the only way anybody gets to heaven is by trusting the blood of Jesus Christ to forgive us of our sins. There is no other way of salvation apart from the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, an interesting thought here in the Word of God. Nobody is saved because they believe Jesus Christ was a good guy or a nice guy or they uh, appreciate Christ or they adore Christ or even have the highest thoughts about Jesus Christ. Now, see, nobody is saved simply by thinking that Jesus Christ was a good man or that he even performed miracles and uh, did a lot of wonderful things and he was kind and sweet and forgiving and uh, uh, so forth. Now, that's the Jesus that is preached in most churches. See, that's exactly the Lord Jesus Christ that's preached in most churches. Now, it's an interesting study in the Bible of the people who came to Jesus and complimented Jesus Christ and were not saved. Now, unsaved people. Now, number one, that's the way Nicodemus was. See, Nicodemus came to Jesus. He said, we know thou art a teacher come from God. Uh, no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. And then when you read uh, the word of God, you see, uh, Jesus said, you must be born again. And Nicodemus uh, had no idea what Jesus was talking about. He said, how can these things be? But now you see, there's a man who came to Jesus Christ and he had the highest regard for Jesus Christ. He even said, thou art a teacher come from God. And that's, a, that's quite a compliment. Uh, no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with, uh, uh, be with him. And yet, in John chapter 3, Nicodemus was not saved. He had a lot of good things to say about Jesus Christ, and he was not saved in John chapter 3 because the Bible doesn't say he was saved in John chapter 3. But later on, we know that he did get saved because he, along with Joseph of Arimathea, prepared the body and buried the body of, of the Lord Jesus Christ, which indicates that obviously... Uh, he did get saved later on. But now, the point we're making, see, he came to Jesus and had all of these wonderful, fantastic things to say about Jesus Christ. And I dare say that if he came to the average church in America, even Bible-believing church, he would have been uh, brought into the membership, he would have been baptized, he would have been looked upon as somebody who was saved. Now, See, Nicodemus was not saved, even though he had the highest regard for Jesus Christ. And when Jesus did talk to him about salvation, he didn't have the, uh, the, uh, the vaguest idea uh, about what Jesus Christ uh, meant in relation 
to being born again, going to heaven, and that type of a thing. Now, you remember the other man in the Bible, and there are several like this, see, and that's why we're bringing out the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, you remember the, uh, what's referred to as the uh, rich young ruler, the man who is very, very rich, and the Bible says that he came running to Jesus, and he knelt down before Jesus Christ. Now, and the, uh, the amazing thing the Bible says about that, that young man is that uh, the Bible says he called Jesus good master. By the way, that's the only time, I believe, in the entire gospel record that he was ever referred to as a good master. Now, that was the equivalent of saying, uh, giving Jesus Christ the highest praise. See, uh, he, even the rabbis were not referred to as good um, uh, teacher uh, and that type of a thing. But he said, good master. Now, you remember about that uh, young man. He came running. He kneeled down before Jesus Christ, and yet he was not saved. Why? Because the Bible says that he went away from Jesus Christ sorrowful. See, now, he had the highest regard for Jesus Christ, but he was not uh, saved. Now, I think that helps us understand that, you see, uh, no one is saved apart from the blood of Jesus Christ. No matter what they say about Jesus Christ, no matter uh, how good they say Jesus Christ is, no matter what they say about Jesus Christ, no one is saved unless they are trusting in the blood of Jesus Christ to be saved. Now, say in Revelation chapter 9, or Ch Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9, say they're singing about the blood. Now, they're not singing about their goodness. You see, and here in this chapter, they're not even singing about the goodness of the Lord Jesus, but it's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that they are uh, singing about. You see, uh, thou hast redeemed us to God by thy blood. See, that's the Lamb of God. That's the blood that is the basis of our salvation. Now, look down in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 12, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the Lamb. See, Revelation chapter 5 and verse 12. Uh, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain. You see, he was slain. But now in this heavenly scene in verse 12, it's, it says here, worthy is he to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. How we need to honor the Lord Jesus Christ. But you see what it says there in verse uh, 12 with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain. See, over and over again, 28 times you have that word, the lamb of God. See, Jesus referred to as uh, the lamb. Now, uh, turn over a page or two to Revelation chapter 7 and in verse 14. And here we see the cleansing power of the Lamb of God, the blood of Christ. See, in Revelation 7 and verse 14, And I said unto him, Sir, uh, thou knowest, and he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, they, uh, their robes, see well, what it says here, they washed their robes and made them white. See, that's being cleansed, that's being uh, forgiven, you see, uh, uh, of their sin. And the Bible uh, says here, in, made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, you see what the book of the Revelation is getting at? See, uh, they sing about the blood in heaven. And then here in this verse, it talks about those who were saved during that tribulation period. And the Bible says they were made clean. They were made white. They're made pure in the sight of God, not through their good works, not through what they did, but see, the blood of the Lamb. See, it cleanses us and makes us as white as snow in the sight 
of, uh, of God. Then as you uh, study the book of the Revelation, see, there's another uh, very interesting thought. Now we're talking tonight about the blood of Christ. See, and uh, that is, it talks about the Lamb's book. You see, the registration book in heaven of every saved person. Their, their name, Jesus said in Luke 10 and verse 20, their names are written in heaven. There's a registry in heaven of every saved person. Now, uh, look at it in Revelation 13 and verse 8. And the Bible says here in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8, and all, they, uh, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Say, uh, that's talking about the Antichrist, the coming world dictator, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So now, what we learn here in the Word of God is that the only names that are in the book of life here, the lambs, as it refers to here, uh, the book of life of the Lamb, are those who, you see, have applied the blood of Jesus Christ to their lives. Now, somebody hadn't applied the blood, their names are not written there. See, whose names are uh, not written in the book of uh, uh, life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, say it's talking about those that worship the Antichrist and say they are not saved. They, they don't know the Lord. But say in Revelation 13, verse 8, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Say, and the world will worship the Antichrist. Say, they'll glorify him and so forth. And uh, the world is headed in that direction today. But say, why will they worship the uh, the the uh, dictator, the Antichrist, see, whose names, say, are not, say, they're not written, um, the Bible says here, in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the, uh, uh, of the world. So, say, uh, the reason why people live the way they do, they dishonor Jesus Christ, they will worship the Antichrist, is because, say, their names are not uh, written in the Lamb's book of life, which means what? Say they have never trusted the blood of Christ to forgive them of their sin. Now, uh, with that in mind, uh, turn over to Revelation chapter uh, 21 and verse 27. Revelation chapter 21 and verse uh, 27. And the Bible says, and there shall in no wise Revelation 21 and verse 27. Say, now we're thinking about the blood of Christ, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth. Talking about the uh, heavenly uh, scene here. Uh, Nor work abomination, or maketh a lie. But you say, now this is talking about the heavenly state. But they which are written, say, and what's it say? In the Lamb's book of life. Say, in the Lamb's book of life. Now, why is it referred to as the Lamb's book? Say, the Lamb was slain. The Lamb shed his blood. Say, that speaks of the blood of Jesus Christ. Say, and um, when the Bible says here, which are written in the Lamb's book of life, you say, why are their names registered in heaven? Say, uh, why can a person know they are going to heaven? Why? Because you see, when we're trusting the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross to forgive me of my sin, my name is written in heaven. So uh, you see, but all of these verses talk about the lamb, the lamb that was slain. You see, uh, the fact that he shed his blood. And that's the way we can know that our sins are forgiven, that we're as white as snow in the sight of God. And number two, say that our names are written in heaven. That's what the Bible says. Say they're in the Lamb's book of life. Say, again, the Lamb's book. Say, the one who shed his blood for us. And that's the only way to get in that book is by trusting his blood to forgive us of our sin. But then as you turn back to Revelation chapter 6, and uh, here is an interesting 
chapter in the Word of God talking about the judgment of God, I believe, during the uh, tribulation period. But then we read about a, a very interesting thing about the Lamb of God. And that's found in Revelation 6 and verse 16. And they said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face. Now, this is a time when God is going to judge the world. Now, just a little footnote here. John is being persecuted. See, Jesus Christ was crucified. Most of the Christians at this time are being persecuted. They are under the gun, so to speak. Now, you see how this all fits in with the book of the Revelation? See, now God reveals to John there's coming a day when Jesus Christ will judge the world, you see, and bring an end to all of the rebellion in the world. Now, I'm sure that was a great encouragement to John. See, now keep in mind, this is written to persecuted Christians. The book of the Revelation is written to persecuted Christians. See, and he's saying there's coming a time, say, when Jesus Christ comes back, that he'll put all, uh, uh, down all rebellion in the world. Now, John, you're being persecuted right now. The church is being persecuted. But there's coming a time when Jesus will come and bring it in to um, and judge the world as we know it. See, Revelation 6 and verse 16, and said to the mountains and the rocks, these are unsaved people. You say, uh, fall on us and hide us uh, from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. But you see what it says here in verse 16? And from the wrath of the Lamb. See, the wrath of the Lamb. Now, a lot of times, you know, we want to hear about a Jesus uh, who never talks about judgment, never involved in judgment. But you see, now this is the wrath of the Lamb. See, everything that we read about Jesus in heaven goes back to Calvary. It goes back to the cross. It goes back to the shedding of his blood. That's where he defeated Satan. That's where Satan was uh, delivered the death blow. And someday in the future, Satan will be cast into the lake of fire with all his followers. But now, see, it says, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath. That's the wrath of the Lamb. See, the judgment of the Lamb. The, uh, the great day of his judgment has come, and who shall be able to stand? And the answer there is no one. See, when God pours out his judgment, see, no one is able to stand against God during this time of judgment that we read about here in the Word of God. So you see, we read about uh, the blood of the Lamb that they sing about. We read about the Lamb uh, blood cleansing us and making us white in the book of the Revelation. And then uh, we read about the Lamb's book. The registration of heaven is only for those who applied the blood to their life. They think they're good enough to get to heaven. They're going to heaven because they're religious or they're good and so forth. Nobody uh, uh, ever will be recorded in the Lamb's book of life unless they are trusting the blood of Jesus Christ. In other words, what he did on the cross of Calvary. Now, with that in mind, turn to John chapter 5, because, see, uh, this is an interesting thing. See, and now again, the book of the Revelation is written to those who are suffering. And the Lord Jesus reveals to John, there's coming a day when the suffering will be done, when God will judge the world, you see. And I'm sure that was an encouragement uh, to John. He would not see it in his day. We have not seen it, but there's coming a day when God will judge uh, the, uh, the world. Now, in John chapter 5 and verse 22, John chapter 5, and we read here in verse 22, say, For the Father judgeth no man, but, had co but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Now, John 5, 22, say, The Father 
will not be the judge on the great judgment day. See, the Son, the Lamb of God, will be the judge on that great judgment day. Now, uh, he says he has committed all judgment under the Son, that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which hath sent him. And that's a great verse in the Bible. Say, where the, we need to honor the Son as we honor the Father. A great verse there about the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, uh, the Bible says, uh, verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. See, that's the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they that hear shall live. In other words, he, we uh, read about that voice in chapter 1, uh, will raise the dead. He'll have the power to raise the bodies of the dead. And the Bible uh, says here, and the dead shall hear his voice and the, of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. Uh, for as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath uh, given him authority, see, to execute judgment. See, Jesus Christ will be the judge at the great judgment day, because he is the Son of of man and the Son of Man uh, speaks of his deity. Uh, a lot of times, people are uh, not necessarily biblical. They say the Son of Man refers to his humanity. No, it doesn't refer to his humanity. It refers to his deity. Uh, in the Book of Daniel, say uh, the Messiah, God, is referred to as the Son of Man. So that refers to his deity. Deity, and the Bible says to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. So now what we learn is that the Lamb of God, you see, uh, the book of Revelation talks about the wrath of the Lamb, but you see, He is the judge. He is the one who will execute judgment. Who is the one that will execute judgment? It is the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, He's the Lamb of God, but you see, now that lamb is a nice uh, animal you pet, and it's a, a harmless, innocent animal. But we read in Revelation chapter 6 of the wrath of the lamb. See, and all of this goes back to the fact that he died on Calvary. And he, because of his, the shedding of his blood on Calvary's cross, he has the right now to judge the world. And he will, because all judgment is given unto him. Now, with that in mind, turn to Acts chapter 17 and verses 30 and uh, 31. Now, in Acts chapter 17 and verses 30 and uh, uh, 31. And the Bible says here, uh, in the times of uh, this ignorance God winked at, but now Paul is preaching here in, at Athens, and he says, but now... This is Acts 17 and verse uh, 30. But now he commands. By the way, that's a, that's a very powerful verse there. In Bible. Uh, he commands. He doesn't advise uh, people. He commands them. Every person is commanded by God. You see what? In verse 30, uh, he commandeth all men everywhere. All men everywhere to repent. See, man is under the command of God to repent. Now, the next verse, it says, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man. See, he's going to judge the world. Jesus Christ will judge every individual. Uh, the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Now, how do we know that Jesus Christ will be the judge at the great judgment day? And how do we know uh, that people ought to repent? And uh, how do we know that um, uh, if they don't repent, 
They'll be judged by God, by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now it says, uh, by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he had raised him from the dead. Say, how do you know that people ought to repent of their sins? God commands it. How do we know that Jesus Christ will be the judge at the judgment day? See, because he raised him from the dead. That verifies the fact that he will judge. How do we know he will judge all people? Because, see, he was raised from the dead. That's the resurrection. The resurrection proves. Now, see, the resurrection verifies everything that Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary. That he died, he shed his blood so that you and I can be forgiven of our sin. But here's something the Bible teaches about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that is, see, the resurrection is the guarantee that he will judge the world someday. And that every individual someday will stand before him. How do we know? that he's going to judge the world, see? And that is because he was raised from the dead. That's the proof that he gives. That's how he proves that uh, he will be the judge at the great judgment day. Now, it's very interesting when you read the next few verses here, how people responded to that. See, there, there are some that re rejected the message of the Apostle Paul. See, they said that, you know, that's a lot of foolishness. Uh, we, we don't think uh, what you're saying is true, and they rejected the message. Now, as you read on there in that passage, there's a second group of people, and they said, we'll hear you later, we'll hear you some other time. Now, the only problem there is, uh, I don't know if Paul ever came again and preached there in Athens. But then the third group of people the Bible teaches that some uh, cleaved unto Paul. In other words, they actually believed what Paul said. And there were some prominent people there that you read about in the passage that actually believed what Paul said. They became Christians and they were uh, uh, saved. Now, you see, Revelation chapter 6, see, the wrath of the Lamb. Now, the Lamb died for our sins. He shed His blood. For the remission of sins, Jesus said, as we think of the Lord's Supper, this is my blood which is shed for you for the remission of sins, the forgiveness of sins. That's why he died. But you come to the book of the Revelation and John chapter 5, you read there about the wrath of the Lamb that he will be the judge at the uh, great uh, judgment day. Well, I trust that God will speak to our hearts. But you see, all of this is based on the shedding of his blood on Calvary. See, uh, not only the fact that he is the Savior, he can forgive me on the basis of his blood, he can cleanse me. Uh, it's the uh, focus of worship in heaven, um, the Bible is very, very clear. They, uh, they sung a new song. Thou art uh, uh, worthy because uh, thou wast slain and redeemed us to God by thy blood. We're made as white as snow in the sight of God through the blood of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, you see, that book in heaven that registers every saved person's name in that book is referred to as the book of the Lamb of God, the Lamb's book, you see, which means what? See, nobody goes to heaven apart from the blood of Christ. Nobody goes to heaven apart from the cross of Calvary. And we see that emphasis there in the book of the Revelation. And I'm sure that encouraged John. And I'm sure as this book was distributed, to the early Christians, who most of them were persecuted at that particular time. See, this is a great encouragement.
See, that someday the world will be judged. The world is not going to keep on going on as it uh, is today or it was then. But there's coming a day when God will judge the world. And who will be the judge of the world? Now, when he came the first time, they judged him. They rejected him. They spit in his face. They slapped him. They pulled the hairs out of his uh, uh, face. They, they crucified the Son of God. But now, in the future... You see, he will be the judge and he will uh, pour out his wrath upon the world. Well, I'm sure in many, many ways that encouraged John and the early believers. Now, that's a new way to look at the book of the Revelation. Now, most people, when they come to the book of the Revelation, the most important thing is a prophecy. I want to know about all these prophecy and how many times Jesus is left out. See, and you don't hear much about Jesus. You hear a lot about current events and news articles, but you don't hear much about Jesus Christ, you see. And yet, see, he is the main figure in the book of the Revelation. See, like the, the seven churches. See, uh, in Revelation 2 and 3, the book starts out with seven local geographical churches in seven different cities. But see, who's the Lord of the church? See, who's the one who can judge the church? Who's the one that can chastise the church? Who is the one that straightens out church? See, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And throughout the book of the Revelation, see, he is the one that is glorified. He is the one that is magnified. And when we study the book of the Revelation in that light, see, the whole book of the Revelation takes on new meaning uh, for us, a new encouragement for us. A good uh, way to re uh, refer to the book of the Revelation uh, is that uh, uh, someday Jesus is going to come. Someday he is going to uh, straighten things out. And we might sing that, uh, that song. See, it will be worth it all. Say, when we see Jesus, or we might say, when Jesus comes again, when we see him, we live for him, we uh, trust him, we love him. But you see, all of it goes back to the lamb. See, the lamb shed his blood. The lamb speaks of a sacrifice given to us, for us so that we could be forgiven of our sins. That is why the Bible teaches that we need to observe the Lord's Supper. You see, because that's central to the Christian faith. See, is the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, once again, say, 28 times in the book of the Revelation, he's referred to as a lamb. That's the most common way he is referred to. Now, the line of the tribe of Judah, one time. King of kings, Lord of lords, two times in the book of the Revelation. But 28 times he's referred to as the Lamb of God. Why? Say everything goes back to Calvary. Say not only the forgiveness of our sins, but the fact that Jesus Christ has the authority to judge that he will be the authoritative judgment uh, judge of the world. Why? Because he died on the cross of Calvary. See, everything goes back to Calvary. Boy, if we just get a hold of the cross, it would make all of us a lot better Christians. See, we don't realize the magnificence, the power, the blessing of the cross of Jesus Christ. And that's why we are to observe the Lord's Supper, and it's commanded that we observe the Lord's uh, Supper. As we turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we read here in uh, verse, uh, uh, verse 26. See, for as often as ye eat this bread, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, 26, and drink this cup, Ye show, now the word show means to preach, to proclaim, the Lord's death till he come. See, he's going to come. That's the second coming. But until he comes, we are to observe the, uh, the Lord's death till he come. Now, 
Again, not his birth, not his life. Now, uh, the Bible verifies that he's all that he claimed to be by his resurrection, but the Lord's Supper does not observe his resurrection. The Lord's Supper does not uh, observe his second coming. Now, we are to do it until he comes back again. But you see, why the cross? Why the blood? Why? Because everything's based on the blood of Christ. Everything's based on the cross. All our salvation and the authority that Jesus Christ has to judge the world, according to Revelation chapter 5, is because he was slain and shed his blood. See, uh, great truth in the Word of God. Well, that's the book of the Revelation. See, the blood, the lamb, that's the thing we need to get a hold of in the book of the Revelation. And it'll help, our, uh, help us and bless us and edify us in the things of God.